Good morning and welcome to B8. Um, I forgot the name of this room. It is Cultivating and a Beloved Community in Oakland, California. My name is Mimi Nguyen. I am currently a school counselor at Westlake Middle School located in Oakland, California, United States. And um, joining me today is our wonderful principal, Maya Taylor, and our uh, wonderful uh, professor slash colleague slash um, uh, a person who is dear to um, our hearts, um, Dr. Rollin Lewis. It looks like our audience member is Emily Santiago. Oh. Hi, Rolla. Hi, Hi, Maya. Welcome, Emily. Uh, would you mind letting us know where you're from? Uh, well, I used to live right near Westlake. And oh, nice. Uh, my daughter would have gone to school there, but uh, we moved three years ago up to Oregon. So now I'm in Ashland, Oregon. Um, and I was a graduate of the Ed Psych Department at Cal State, too. And I was a school psychologist in the Bay. So nice. Nice to be here. Okay. So we'll probably have a couple more minutes. Here comes somebody else. The, the groups can be small or large. The last one that I was in, there were uh, three other people. So uh, I don't know how long you want to wait, but uh, I, I guess we can wait another minute. Uh, Hi, Africa. So we have one more person joining. So it's your call, one, because we only have until uh, this goes until 1115. All right, so welcome everyone. I will go ahead and um, start. Again, my name is Mimi Nguyen. A uh, brief introduction. I uh, was born in Saigon, Vietnam, emigrated here in the late 80s, uh, grew up in Oakland, California, uh, went through elementary, junior high, and high school in Oakland. Uh, Got my um, undergrad and graduate degrees at well, Cal State Hayward, now East Bay. And uh, I've been working with o Oakland Unified School District as a school counselor for five years, for the past five years. And again, joining me is Maya Taylor, our school principal. Thank you, Mimi. Um, good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. I'm Maya Taylor, I'm principal here at Westlake Middle School, along with Mimi. Um, I was born in Stockton, California, moved to Oakland when I was 10. So I finished elementary, junior high, and high school also here in Oakland. Um, <clears throat> went away to school and came back and did some advocacy work in the district in Oakland Unified. Um, so I've actually been working in Oakland Unified since 2001. Um, also, completed my degree um, to become a school counselor. I was a school counselor for four years and then moved into the world of administration. <clears throat> moved to the dark side, but it's actually the bright side. Um, really enjoying my work as a principal. Um, and so I've been in administration for the past six years. Well, I'm Rolla Lewis. I am uh, have twisted these uh, women's arms to make this presentation based on the fact that I went to visit Westlake uh, right before the pandemic. And with all the stereotypes you have about Oakland, California, this and that, uh, uh, I went there and uh, I walked into the school and it was split at that time. Uh, Part of the campus was being used as a high school and then the rest of the campus. I thought, oh boy, this is gonna be a challenge. Well, I go in and the kids are greeting me. Hi, how are you? And I'm 
and they were very helpful. I go in, the staff is very warm and inviting. Uh, and then uh, Maya and Mimi uh, gave me a tour around. Mimi let me sit in on a session with her where she was doing some work uh, using solution focused practice with a young woman. And it was just a, a real loving space. And I'm doing, gosh, more people should know about what's happening in schools in Oakland like this. This is really uh, 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 creating space of, uh, uh, I would say beloved space because the, the kids, the, uh, one of the challenges at Westlake uh, was they are, are the uh, center for special day students from middle school. And uh, the teachers and other people uh, work, working with the kids, uh, it was just really safe and warm, loving space. And one more thing, as I, when I was walking around, Maya was sitting in the, uh, hallway at a desk greeting kids and talking to them and and she can obviously talk to the kids in a way I couldn't because if I I yelled across the room at a kid it would come off as the angry white guy she can do it with all the moxie uh, uh, that she has and and just hold the kids accountable and and bring them in and talk to them in a very uh tender and and loving ways uh she was uh there and uh, just seeing their interactions with uh, the kids and with uh, the teachers, I, uh, I became very excited. So anyways. Did you, did you guys wanna talk any more about? Uh... Sure, we can, we can just give you all just a, you know, sort of a snapshot of um, our school community, the types of, we, we call our students scholars, so you'll hear us say that quite a bit, um, the types of scholars that we have at our school. Um, so you get kind of a picture of who's in the building and then talk a little bit more about um, the ways in which we've built community. So Amy, if you want to start. Thank you, Mai. So uh, Westlake is consider it's not con really a feeder school. We are kind of like a neighborhood school. We have scholars from all over um, Oakland coming to attend Westlake. And so we consider ourselves pretty diverse. Um, we uh, are located, I would say, in the center of Oakland between like uh, North Oakland neighborhood, downtown Oakland and West Oakland. Uh, we have uh, different programs here for scholars. We have a uh, newcomers program. We have uh, like four different special, edu uh, special education programs. And um, our demographics is mostly uh, scholars of color, uh, African-American and Latinx. And please jump in anytime I am missing anything. Um, we offer, uh, again, our, our demographic is really diverse here and we have staff and scholars speaking multiple languages. We have um, scholars speaking Spanish, um, Arabic, Chinese, Japanese, um, Tigrinya, and most recently mom. And we have staff who also speak Spanish, Chinese. Um, I myself speak Vietnamese to support um, any Vietnamese students and families here. And yeah, that's that's uh, what I have so far. We also have um, <clears throat> our uh, one hundred percent of the scholars on our campus qualify for free and reduced lunch. Um, so that speaks to the socioeconomic sort of status of the scholars that we serve, um, as well as, um, as Mimi was mentioning, <clears throat> excuse me, 26% of our population are English learners. Um, and of that 26%, 7% of those scholars are new to the country. Um, so 
the range of skill sets and the range of mastery of um, of our content standards really varies um, based upon where scholars are coming from. And so <clears throat> the community that's built within our school building is very authentic because as Mimi stated, we don't have a direct feeder elementary school. Most um, <clears throat> middle schools have an elementary school that's down the street or one that like most kids um, transfer from that elementary into the same middle school. And so kids have been with each other since kindergarten or preschool. We don't have that because of us being so centrally located. Um, and so we have scholars from every part of Oakland. Um, and so that, that um, lens that we have to create community in here because here the community is the Westlake community. It's not because you're from West Oakland or because you live in North Oakland. It's the community that's built within the building is really because of you being a scholar here and being a part of this school community. Um, and, and we found that our scholars really take hold to that. Um, it's taken us a couple of years. Mimi, I've been here at the site for six years. Mimi's been for five. It's taken that time to really um, build that community and have scholars begin to take pride in Westlake and being a member or a part um, of this school. Um, some of the things that we do to build community are, we have a model that we say every day um, that the kids hear every day in the announcements, which is please remember to take care of yourself, take care of one another and take care of Westlake, which just lends itself to, without using the word community, say that's what we're about. Um, we hold very high expectations for our scholars. If you were to go online and look at where we land as far as um, scholars meeting grade level standards, we don't have very many scholars who meet grade level standards. And so we have to be um, very creative in the ways in which we engage our uh, scholars in curriculum and how we're able to help them to demonstrate the knowledge base that they have while at the same time um, assessing and addressing those gaps that may be there for them. And in my opinion, the only way that you can really get a scholar to want to learn, to, um, to uh, realize that there are gaps and want to you know, close those gaps is for there to be a strong community and there be caring relationships on campus. And so um, we try to do that in a lot of different ways. Um, definitely by putting kids first, um, but also just um, we only have about 280 kids on our campus, so it's not a large school. So literally, um, each one of us, myself and, Ms. and Mimi included, we probably know the names of all of our kids. Minus two or three, sorry, that's the bill. Minus, you know, 10 or 15 kids, we may not know their names, but we know our kids by name. And I think that's also important. Um, just as a principal, I think it's important for a scholar to know that their principal knows them personally and that they're not just some child who's walking down the hallway or they're not the kid who always has to come and talk to the principal or the one that the principal has to always pull to the side, but that like, you know my name, you know who I am, you know something about me. Um, to me, that's very important. I don't Super. Know if should, should we transition into the uh, appreciative interview uh, right now? Yes. Are you guys ready for that? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'll just, uh, this is pretty much uh, for our audience, a, a, a revision of an appreciative uh, interview protocol that we used while we were at the university. And we thought it would be fun to conduct an appreciative uh, interview about what's happening at Westlake. And uh, I'll ask the questions and uh, you guys can trade off who goes first and who goes second on them. Uh, but we've got six basic core questions that will uh, take us through. So, and appreciative uh, interviews are really trying to focus on the positive core. What, what's, what's happening? Uh, what's What's good? What gives life to the organization? What gives life to the, to the school? So we'll see uh, what happens from this. So uh, let's see, I'll, I'll start with Mimi. Uh, think of a time in your entire experience as a counselor at, at uh, Westlake when you felt most excited, most engaged and most alive. 
what were the forces or factors that made it a great experience? Uh, one event we have a few years back is a cultural day, and that's when I felt the most alive and um, really, really uh, actually happy. Um, one of our math teachers put together, uh, and, and our a newcomer social worker, they collaborated and created cultural day where we celebrate uh, the different cultural background and culture from uh, from our not just our uh, newcomers English learner but also our um, mainstream uh, English classes and our math the math teacher at that time went and got supplies and create this. I don't know what it's called, but he put together all of the different world flags, at least from where scholars are from, and displayed it. And staff and students would uh, put on attire from their cultural background. And we had a fashion show. We did um, like we we had uh, games and and food that are uh, from different that you know, staff might may or may not make or just picked up from the store and, and students and families um, helped put together and brought to school. So uh, that, that was one of my favorite celebrations here at Westlake. And I would not, I would not forget because it's so important for us uh, to build community and also to, 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 to teach and uh, expose many of our scholars to different cultures and to so that they will understand each other, understand each other's cultural background and appreciate that um, where they're from and, and um, just sharing their own life story or their own cult, uh, culture and um, so that we, we all can, appre again, appreciate um, each other and, 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 and uh, build a really strong and loving community. Okay, super. Maya, I'll, re I'll repeat that for, for you. So Maya, think of a time in your entire experience as a principal at Westlake when you felt most excited, most engaged, and most alive. What were the forces and factors that made it a great experience? What was it about you, others, and the Westlake Junior High School learning community that made it a peak experience for you? Um, I would have to say at our uh, graduation or promotion ceremony three years ago, um, <clears throat> that year was kind of tough. Um, we had experienced the loss of a student that year. At the beginning, um, we went through a strike, teacher strike that year. But to be able to come back and have our scholars to walk the stage together, unified, um, and they had gone through all of those things during their eighth grade year, I think really brought life in, um, back to our school and helped us to center around what our true purpose was. Um, one of the highlights of the promotion ceremony that year was the young lady who was our promotion speaker. Um, she was someone who my first year as an assistant principal here came in as a sixth grader and was really struggling behaviorally. Academically, she was strong, but the behavior would get in the way of us knowing that. Um, and um, to see her transformation from sixth grade to eighth grade um, go from literally she was the first student that I ever had to suspend as an as an assistant principal. Um, but then to watch her give a promotion speech and just talk about her experiences in middle school and how it was starting to shape her into who she wanted to become, um, how she listened to folks in our community who you know, poured into her and talked to her over the years that she was here um, and her in the eighth grade, like that plant, those seeds that have been planted sixth and seventh grade finally taking root in her understanding who she really wanted to be. Um, and so to have her get up and speak 
in front of not only her uh, classmates, but the school and parents and family members who are in attendance at the promotion ceremony was really about um, and really personified who we want to be as a school, um, demonstrated what we want our scholars to do as they come through our school, which is to really like transform and change into better people. Um, and she's gone on to do even greater things in high school, but um, that was a moment that felt really good to me because she was a challenge for everyone in the sixth grade. And so folks were able to remember who she was and then see who she had become. Um, and it just spoke to how everyone in the community in some way had poured into her to help her, um, her transformation. Sounds like it transformed your heart a bit too. <laughs> uh, okay, Maya, I'm gonna start with you on this next one. Uh, what do you value most about yourself and your, your own learning power and, and Westlake? Um, I would have to say that um, what I would value the most about my own learning power is being able to be transparent with the staff. Um, as I stated before, that I did not want to be an administrator that was not in the plans for me. I was going to be a school counselor until the day of retirement or so I thought. Um, and so um, stepping into the assistant principal role wasn't something I wanted. I just decided that I would try it because I was asked to. And if I didn't like it, I could always go back to my first love, which was school counseling. Um, but I ended up enjoying what I was doing and then not knowing two years into that, that I would be asked to step into the principal seat. And so stepping into this role, um, I made it very clear to our staff that um, I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to be learning along the way. And so it's OK for us to make mistakes as long as we're learning from those um, and really empowering and activating others to serve as experts in their area. So I'm always going to teachers because I don't have that teacher training, that teacher background. I'm always going to them to ask them to help me understand curriculum or standards or pedagogy or things like that. Um, and that we all in some way serve as experts in our respective positions, um, but that my success is really based upon um, the success of everyone else. And so it's not just me that's leading the school and, and helping us to get better, but it's everybody doing their part. So I think for me, I'm um, just letting folks know that it's okay to say, I don't know. It's okay to say, I'm not sure, I'll try to figure it out and that, um, every last one of us contributes to the success of, of the school. Okay, super. Okay, Mimi, what do you value most about yourself, your learning power, and Westlake? Um, for me, I would say uh, my bilingual and bicultural skills and intersectionality, going from being an immigrant to um, an American citizen and growing up in pretty low income neighborhood to being able to go to college and graduate school and now giving back to the community, um, helping out not just uh, people from the same background as myself, but also um, people who are from neighborhoods that I grew up in. and. Um, it, that also helped me with uh, my learning power is just to um, understand and listen to people's stories, um, understand their background, where they're from, um, relating and, uh, and, and showing uh, empathy and just learning different ways to help them um, regardless if there is some sort of cultural gap or language gap there, at least I can uh, reflect on my own experience, my own upbringing or uh, experience with where I'm from and where I'm heading to, to help, to help um, students at Westlake or even uh, people in the community. Super. Well, you get to get this one as well. And as you recall from before, the, uh, some of these uh, loop back on themselves. So uh, what are the Westlake uh, learning community's best practices, the way it manages and approaches and its traditions? 
uh, just the way it, it really might manage things or approach things in different traditions that you guys have started. Um, I didn't start this, but there is a model that we go by, uh, which is to take care of yourself, take care of one another, and taking care of uh, Westlake. So it's important that we, uh, as a community, learn and practice how to take care of ourselves. Then we can go and, and help another person or help um, each other and that way so that we can um, overall, um, take care of Westlake. Um, that, so that's, um, we say that every morning we have scholars repeat that model with us and we have, um, different, uh, sometimes we do have to remind them. So, uh, either through classroom presentation or assemblies, we always um, instill in them that, you know, it's important to, um, to, to, to live up to our motto um, by taking care of yourself, taking care of one another in Westlake. Super. Maya, same question. So uh, what are the Westlake Learning Community's best practices, the way it manages its approaches, its traditions? Yeah, I mean, I took that one. I was going to talk about the model. Thank you. <laughs> Me? Um, <laughs> I would have to say um, something that we just recently did on yesterday. Um, in my time as leader, I've made it a practice that when there are difficult situations or um, things going on on campus, that as a staff, we circle up and have those hard conversations with one another. And, create, and we've created a safe space where folks can um, can talk about how they're feeling, um, whether we agree with one another or not, but we walk away still um, connected as a community. And um, I think that that's important for us um, as educators to be able to have those hard conversations with one another um, so that we can practice that with our young folks, that they can learn and be inquisitive and ask questions when they don't understand something. And maybe they're going to ask a question that might like really challenge who we are and what our perspective is and where we stand. But we need to allow them the space to be able to do that type of um, questioning and critical thinking. I mean, who better to do it with, with them with adults that they feel safe with. So um, we practice that as an adult community um, to circle up and have those hard conversations with one another. Um, and another thing is that I think that um, our staff um, is good about helping out wherever is needed. Um, so no one feels like they're above picking up trash. No one feels like they're above helping out with supervision. No one feels like that's not my job. I don't have to help. Like if something comes across that there's help needed, um, folks are ready to, to lend that help and in, in um, the way of learning for our scholars that also shows them what community looks like and that in community people step up whenever there's a gap or there's extra support needed. Super. Okay, here's, here's another one for you, Maya. What are the unique aspects of your Westlake culture that most positively affect the spirit, vitality and effectiveness of your school and it's work educating the scholars and creating that learning community. Um, I would have to say um, one of the main factors would be um, the diversity on campus and that um, not only do our scholars, but uh, the adults on campus have the opportunity to, to learn from and be around all different kinds of people. Um, that's something that I think really sets us apart from other campuses um, here in the city. Also, the ability to just be an individual. Um, we were having the conversations yesterday about dress code and, you know, folks feel a certain way about the way people should be able to dress. And I just shared with um, the staff that I have a way that I feel about dress code here on campus. 
but our new assistant principal also has a way that she feels about it. And we've had conversation um, and, and we found a sort of a happy medium. Um, and she helped me to sort of reframe my thoughts around um, dress code and how it can um, kind of stifle young people's individuality, um, their, their self-expression. And so um, I had to like back up a little bit because I hadn't thought about it in that way. Um, and so I think us being able to challenge one another in those ways too um, opens up the doors for our scholars to be able to learn about themselves, but um, also to just have the freedom to sort of um, investigate and kind of challenge things that may be happening, which is also a good part of the learning process. Super. Okay, Mimi, uh, what are the unique aspects of your Westlake uh, culture that most positively affect the spirit, vitality, and, and effectiveness of your school and its work educating scholars and creating a learning community? You're going to hear me say diversity a lot, just like Maya mentioned. Yeah, earlier. okay, but uh, that's okay. <laughs> I mean, those are that's that's what this is about for us to loop back in and and. Uh... Yeah. So um, again, we you know scholars, we have um, a really great newcomers program, and we have um, staff who are uh, bicultural. Or, uh, and bilingual. So recently we have um, one of our history teachers uh, in the past have sponsored a, um, a Latinx group, uh, Latinos Unidos. And every year uh, for the past four years, I believe um, he and that group of scholars would uh, create uh, an altar for Dia de los Muertos. And and that's just one of the the, the, the culture um, celebrations that we have here. And myself and another office staff um, are both Asian. And during Lunar New Year, we would also um, do some sort of display to celebrate that. And we also have um, Latinx Heritage Month. We do uh, uh, Black History Month in February. And so just celebrating um, a different cultural background. And uh, although we may not, the scholars may not learn about all of these things in their classes, in their history classes, or, uh, um, but we are trying to, um, trying to show them and, and also teach them in a way about um, all of those things that are uh, from different, you know, history and, and different uh, um, culture from different uh, around the world and just, again, celebrating what we have here. Super. Okay, I'll start with you, Mamie, with this next one. Uh, what is the core factor that gives life to Westlake as a learning community? Uh, I mean, where do I start? Like, we, we have great leadership. <laughs> um, well played. <laughs> yes, I mean, like, and, and, and I always have conversation with, you know, staff and, you know, admin team, just whoever I come across. It's like, we're like a puzzle here. Everyone is a piece of the puzzle. And, you know, we keep each other together, holding each other up. And once there's a missing puzzle, then you know if the the the, the entire thing might feel a little bit, you know, um, not as sturdy. But we somehow still have the other pieces to to hold us together. And so I think you know, starting from the top, you know, from admin Ms. Taylor all the way down to um, like all the support staff we have. Um, we have, uh, you know, staff from after school program, we have a, a, an academic mentor, we have a culture keeper, they all uh, are restorative justice, case manager, um, counseling in training or counseling interns and clinicians. So I think the core factor is just to um, 
people who have a passion to support our scholars to work in this community and and that you know day in and day out every time they step on the campus it's like everyone giving their 120 150 percent and 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 keeping you know the puzzle together um that's is what i think the core factor of westlake is okay let's see what maya thinks what is the core factor that gives life to Westlake learning, to the Westlake learning community? Um, I agree with everything that Mimi said. I also would, would say that um, this might sound a little <laughs> to the left, but we're rebels. Like if there's some initiative that the district is coming out with and we feel like it's not gonna be beneficial to our community, um, I don't have a problem saying to the higher ups like that's not going to work for us and we need to think of a work think about a workaround um, of how to help you meet whatever you need to meet as far as data or quotas or whatever but we're going to tweak this in a way that's beneficial to our community so that we're not just um, doing things for the sake of doing them we try to do things with intention um, and so when we take on various projects or initiatives um, whether it's district mandated or something that we as a school site think is important um there's always some intentionality behind it and so um while we have all those people in place that mimi talked about we just try to make sure that everybody has the same vision and the same messages and, and is on board with where we're trying to go and that there's intention behind every action that we that we do super Okay, now this is the last one, and then we'll get to have uh, our participants uh, come in. What are the three most important hopes you have to heighten the health and vitality of the West Lake uh, learning community in the future? Maya. I was trying to write notes, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> I would say that for me, um, it would be, one would be um, legacy, that practices that we have put into place during the time that I've been here, Mimi's been here, that once we leave this, this place, that those practices have sustainability and that it doesn't stop because we're not here, that the spirit of, of what we all have created collectively doesn't go away because we're not in the building anymore. So that, um, um, I would hope that that could be carried on. So legacy. Um, and yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. No, you had, you had, were asked for three. Oh, you said three. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You are cutting me <laughs> off. Come on, girl. Um, can you repeat the question again? <laughs> what are the three most important hopes you have to heighten the health and vitality of Westlake uh, of the Westlake learning community in the future. Yeah. Um, so legacy, and I also would hope that our scholars would come back to, to our school and give back and share with others. I think that would help with keeping the legacy going, um, but come back and share their experiences and then wherever they are in life on whatever um, expertise or resources that they could bring, that they bring that back to our community. And um, third, probably would be the same for even for staff that that leave so that you know if there was a resource that I had once I leave this place that I could continually give back um, to the Westlake community, even if I wasn't sitting in this particular position. Super. Mimi, do you want me to read the question or you pretty much have it? I uh, pretty much have it. Okay. Um, just well, to echo off what Maya said, you know, just uh, hopefully that Westlake will continue to be a safe learning environment for um, scholars to, um, or even new scholar to come in. Um, speaking of legacy, we we have some of that, and I'm hoping that it will continue because we do have a lot of um, scholars who have had siblings attending. Uh, school here and or uh, older siblings and or younger siblings, you know, coming to Westlake. So I'm hoping that that will um, 
continue and um, that it's because it's not, you know, a feeder school that, you know, like folks from the neighborhood would actually be um, interested in enrolling their scholar here. And um, to, to make it a little bit more diverse. And uh, my third hope is um, I had it and then it went away. So okay. it's there. Well, what, uh, what I'm seeing, and, and before I turn it back to you so that you can uh, involve the other folks, uh, what I'm seeing core in, in this is really the, the glue that binds it together is the relationships that you build with one another, with your staff, with your teachers, with your students. And through and, and while I was visiting and here, the unspoken piece is really, you, you've created a relational space for kids to really grow. And that's where I was most deeply moved being there is that there's a genuine relational space where you can disagree and, and, and challenge one another. And at the same time, you can nurture one another. And that beloved community is very evident, at least in my visit and, and hearing you guys talk about it. So I'll turn it back to you, Mimi, and, and you can probably open it up to the, uh, our, the guests. <laughs> so. All right, Emily. Hello, Michelle. Um, are you too curious about anything? Oh, yeah, I just love hearing your story. I've been a teacher in Oakland as well, and I know the challenges that you face and you're sharing your experience with so much ease in a time when, when I talk to principals, they're so stressed. So I wonder about like how you say, stay grounded as leaders of a school um, and stay focused on relationships when there's so much pulling you away from that, right? There's, like you said, there's so many demands placed on you. There's so many challenges that you have to meet the needs of, of students and staff, but it seems like you're doing it with so much grace. So how do you do that? Um, I think you used the word that I would have used, which is grace. I just give myself grace in that. Mm -hmm. And I tell everybody every day when they come, as long as you're giving whatever your 100% is for that day, then that's all we can ask, right? Mm -hmm. um, we're going to have days when some of us are, <laughs> in the words of the kids, feeling it, and some days when we're not feeling it, right? Mm -hmm. And on those days when um, I can't say that our staff is good about really knowing one another. And so, mm -hmm. you know, we can tell when there's a day when I might not have as much energy as I need, and then other staff members will step up and you know, some call comes across the radio that we need support somewhere and, and I can say I'm on my way and someone can say, I got it, Ms. Taylor. Or mm. it can be vice versa. Ms. Wynn can, you know, need, have a day when she needs some additional support. And so a kid might need to talk to her and there may be three kids outside her office and I could say one of them can come in here and I can check in with them. Like we just sort of like are, are constantly checking in on one another um, because we have built those relationships. And then, yeah, in this time, um, while still holding high expectations for each other and for our kids, just realizing the time that we're in, that like this is so unprecedented and everything is brand new. And so I've also just encouraged our staff to like think outside the box. That one thing that you probably wanted to do five years ago that someone would have told you, are you crazy? Now they're going to say, can you tell us what happens when you do that? Because nobody knows what to do when it's time. Mm -hmm. So I think having um, that sort of like open reign of like, we can try just about anything we want right now. And if it's something that sticks and it works, like we can keep doing that thing because there, that right now there's no cookie cutter. There's never been, but there's really right now no cookie cutter answer to any of the ways in which we need to be responding to kids and the help that they need. So yeah, just giving each other grace. I think every day is important. Thank you. Um, very beginning, I'm curious. Sorry, I missed the very beginning and I'm just curious um, how long you all have been operating this way and was that your goal from the beginning of starting this school to have like an appreciative process that you generated um, to build that community the way that you did? 
this is my fifth year um, at Westlake and uh, I just came in when there was a transition, a huge transition um, happening at Westlake. And so um, I can say that it was a long road with some bumps. Um, however, I think we were able to get over each bump and the road is, is looking a little bit smoother than before. Um, but maybe Maya can let you know more about Uh, yeah, so this is my um, sixth year at Westlake, fourth year as principal. I came in as an assistant principal. Um, and we came into the school. Um, there was a lot going on. Kids didn't feel connected. They didn't feel like they belonged. They didn't feel like people cared about them. And so it was a place where they, you know, it showed in their behavior. I'll just say it that way. Um, my first few months here, literally, like, you would break up a fight outside on the yard and then get a call on the radio that somebody's now fighting in the hallway on the first floor. Now you got to go break that up. And then you're breaking that up and get that separated. And now you got a phone call that their parents outside ready to fight each other because their kids are not getting along. Like, it was that kind of a situation. Um, and we just really, when I became principal four years ago, I said to everybody, we're going to keep rolling with the academics, but community is important and relationship is important. And we got to make sure that kids feel connected. There's, they have at least one caring adult on campus that they can identify. Um, and so we really just went, went hard about community. We had family engagement nights and we would have community activities and events just to pull kids in because I don't think that our scholars had experienced um, number one, what school really felt like, and that's something that this year we've really um, started to examine. Are we a, a real school? What does that mean? Um, but in previous years, like I said, just community, yes, that was going to be our focus. Year one is all about community and, and making community be strong and have a strong presence. And then year two, we started to fold in more of a focus around academics. Um, and then coming back from the pandemic now, um, it's almost like we've had to start over and start again with like community being at the top, you know, top of our list of things that we want to make sure is strong and, and, and is a, a foundation for us. Um, and so we've been trying to do those things. And thankfully, the district received some additional funding so we could have the right people in the building to do that, because we've also not had the positions that we needed in order to hold that. So we finally have a restorative justice facilitator and we have case managers now as Mimi mentioned academic mentor mentors who are in the classes and can work with kids and pull them out and do one-on-one -on -one or small group instruction with kids we just didn't have all the right pieces in place um, and this year we do we have a strong assistant principal previously I mean the whole 18 months of COVID there was no assistant principal it was just me making all the decisions um, I had a leadership team my, with Mimi, who's our counselor, our two teacher coaches, and a community schools manager who kind of serves as a third administrator that supported, um, but it really all rested on my shoulders. So we've just been sort of fragmented all these years, and now we finally have everyone in place that we need in place, and we have the resources, and now we can really try to move our school in the direction we want to. Even the way you talk about the um, development of the school is inspirational because um, like clearly there were so many challenges and I've heard so many principals in schools talk about things in such a discouraged way and while I'm sure they were just as challenging the fact the way that you talk about them as like these building blocks of change and the way that you talk about them in such a I don't want to keep saying inspiring <laughs> but for lack of a better word, but it's inspiring because every one of those challenges, it's like, it feels to me the way you're describing it, like, yeah, they were just the means to this end. They helped us get from this place because we knew this was going to happen. But then we learned more as this went on and there was incredible learning and community building. And now we had to step backward, but you know what? That was just like a thing that we couldn't, we couldn't plan for. And now here's, here's this challenge and we're still building. I don't know. It's it's quite a different dialogue about 
community really building than here in a lot of spaces and educational spaces. So thank you so much for sharing what you have about your school. If I had kids, <laughs> I would want them to go there <laughs> anymore. If I had kids anymore, I'd have grown and gone. <laughs> would have loved to have these kind of opportunities for my, especially my youngest. I just think this is, for me, it's, it's purpose work. Like this is, this is our calling. We're supposed to be here right now doing this with these kids right now. This is what we're supposed to be doing. Cause I didn't want it. I didn't want this job. And you might've missed that part earlier. Mm -hmm. I didn't ask for this. I was a school counselor and that's what I was going to be. <laughs> and so there are moments when I even ask Mimi to step into leadership roles. You know what I mean? Like, I don't see myself as the end all tell all. It takes all of us. And so, um, yeah, to me, it's just, it's just purpose work. And like, it's what our purpose is. It's what our calling is right now for this time, this season, this space, and then we'll be called to something else whenever that time is. But we gotta give our all in this moment for these folks who are here, you know, that's just the way I look at stuff. And we have rough days, we have rough days. Like my radio is down low right now, but the little light hasn't gone off because there's something, there's stuff going on right now. Um, but yeah, but when we get off of this call, Mimi and I are gonna go right out in the hallway and figure out like, where can we help to plug in because we've been, you know, we, we pulled ourselves away for a minute and people were fine with that. They're like, great, go do that. We got it. That's just the kind of uh, kind of staff and community that we have. And in full disclosure, Mimi and I have worked together since 2002. So it's beyond like work relationship. There's a sisterhood that's here. And so that also like breeds into the work that we do. We literally like follow each other wherever we go. I went into the counseling program because Mimi said, I'm going to take the, the, go to the master's program. I'm like, fine. Okay. Then I'll, I'll apply. If we both get in. We'll do it together. So we did it together. And then we ended up at the same school a couple of years after graduate school. And then I came here and I was like, she needs to come here too. Cause we both went through Oakland. And so, yeah. There's clearly a foundation of trust there, right? Cause doing relational work, there's not always the data that says this is going to make the impact that they expect, right? Like on behavioral data or academic data, you have to go with a lot of faith to like root everything in relationships and invest that much. So clearly that takes courage as a leader and that you have the trust with each other to, to make that happen. Cause like you said, people given their all, they have to believe in it, you know? And, and you've obviously created that. So I commend you both. It's really awesome to hear what you're doing. Thank you. I'm curious about how the, you said the families kind of presented some challenges too. And as you're building this community, clearly families are an important part of um, continuing what you're building there. And so how has that gone for you so far? Like family outreach and connection and bringing them into the process. We, um, in the past, we have family engaged with nights and because just transitioning back and with COVID still happening, we are limiting the amount of people coming into the building, you know, with the exception, uh, exception of our um, school community, staff, scholars, et cetera. So um, when we have family engagement nights, we bring in uh, families who do show up, we make them feel like this is their second home, like the scholars feel like this is their second home. And we would, have, you know, we would cook, we would, you know, um, present, like do different workshops and just to let them see how it is here for their scholars so that they know that, oh, okay, you know, my child, um, feel safe or um, are being cared for when when they walk into campus. And I mean, there's some simple things we do too. Like most parents have my cell phone number. <laughs> so if they want to call or text or find out what's going on with their kid, they can do that. And we have that sort of, there, there's that two-way communication also that they tell me, Ms. Taylor, you know, you text me or call me if my child is out of line and um they come in and i think because of the 
the legacy that we're trying to build around it being a safe space that families hear that from other families also. And we have a lot of families who, whose kids come here because somebody else said my child was there and I felt, um, you know, felt safe with my child being there and they really cared. And um, so word of mouth is important amongst families. And even those most challenging families, like I said, families where we've had people ready to literally like go at one another. We brought them in, sat them down, explain to them what our expectations are not only of scholars but are, are of adults and that like this is school and this is not how we handle it and then Oakland is a unique place within itself um, just because of the diversity but also because of the poverty also because of the crime and so we try to show adults a different way that like you don't have to solve you know issues or conflict with violence we can sit down and talk with one another and so um we've pulled families in before and had that experience where they said nobody's ever given me the option to like sit and talk with somebody about something so it's not just about you know educating the child for some people it's educating the family as a whole and giving them a different experience if you've gone to the gas station and you've had a bad experience with people when you go to the gas station you're gonna think every time i go to the gas station it's gonna be a bad experience so just like changing the narrative of what happens when you come to a school um, i think is important for some of our families based upon their past experiences with their children but also their past experiences of their own experiences in school and what they went through so we just try to kind of change that up so that they know that this isn't a place that wants to harm but really wants to help and having come from Oakland, like we understand that. Yeah. Just. Michelle, where, where are you from and where do, are you a teacher or what, what's your role? Well, I was trained as a teacher and then uh, it was 2009 when I graduated, I went back as an adult and um, and so there was just tons of layoffs. So I did some special education programs and then I went off and I work currently for the National Center for Race Amity. And, um, and I also do a lot of community building teaching efforts, working with adults, working with like, the, like that middle grade and then sometimes working with children's or training children's class teachers for community type things. But. I live in Geneva, New York. It's Western New York. Thank you for joining us. And then Emily, I, your name seems so familiar. I don't know if it's from the school psych program or if it's because I've run a, I don't know, your name just seems I think we got connected before we were chatting because I do the trauma-informed certification. Yes. Katie's Bay. So we've chatted, okay. like maybe we've chatted, but I mean, your entire model is like the perfect example of how schools are centers for healing and how you're embodying all those trauma-informed practices. Like, it's beautiful. And uh, yeah, we should chat more because this is a perfect example for our program. So thank you so much, Maya and Mimi. I loved hearing what, what you're doing. Thanks, Rala, for facilitating the conversation. Thank, thank you. So you. Wonderful. Thank you, yeah. Mimi. Thank you, Maya. This is uh, a, a blessing for me. I just have to say thank you. Uh, Mimi, you'll shut off the recorder and send.